Hi, welcome to Humanistic Psychology, that is to say Psychology 4000 here at the University of West Georgia. This video will be uh, the first in a series of videos uh, about getting started in humanistic psychology where we'll be exploring the basic vocabulary, the basic way of moving within psychology, in essence, what humanistic psychology is all about. So that when we get to the first official book in this class, you'll already have an idea what the lay of the land is, what the basic direction is. It'll make the material in the books, I think, a lot more comprehensible to you and at any rate, that's the hope. So, uh, Psychology 4000. Yeah, sounds kind of cool, Psychology 4000. Humanistic Psychology. So, uh, I guess to get you started, uh, let's give you a reading assignment right off. It's not going to be one of the three main books in this class. The way I like to structure these classes goes something like this. I like to have a period in the beginning where you're going to be reading some material that I personally wrote for you. And the reason why is to give you some time to get a hold of the books on the internet because I think that's the best way, especially for students who don't necessarily have a lot of money. That's the best way of getting hold of the books. So I suggest that um, you Check out the books uh, on the internet, I don't know, like eBay, Amazon, Half.com, Name Your Poison. The first of the th three books you'll be reading in this class, by the way, I recently discovered is on uh, PDF for free. Dropping the F-bomb on you in the first material-oriented video in this class. Okay, so your first reading assignment is the three things called conversations listed in introductory readings in Course 10. Okay, so that's a, uh, a series of videos, videos, a series of readings that I made for you where I'm basically um, uh, trying to pretend <laughs> as though you were trying to explain what you're learning in this class to someone who didn't know. So that's sort of the structure of those. A little bit creative, but hey, that's how I roll. All right, so uh, humanistic psychology, let's dig in. So let me let you know how we're going to be proceeding for this video. First, we're going to characterize humanistic psychology negatively. In other words, we're going to say what it is not. So we're going to be proceeding through a sequence of negations. And then eventually when we get done that, uh, we're going to characterize it in more positive terms. So uh, your first definition is going to be more or less toward the negative. So humanistic psychology is a non-reductive non-deterministic and non-atomistic school of psychological thought. Okay, so a bunch of long, <laughs> maybe somewhat scary sounding phrases. They're not that scary. They're fairly simple and straightforward. But the first thing let's talk about is this characterization of humanistic psychology as a school of psychological thought. Okay, so hopefully by this point, since this is a 4,000 level class and you've had intro and probably a couple other courses before taking this class, you're already well aware of the fact that psychology, unlike some other disciplines, is composed of a bunch of competing perspectives within psychology that uh, often will disagree with each other on you know, what the basic sort of foundations, what the basic uh, gist of psychology is all about. That's true <laughs> no matter how you slice the pie. Anyhow, humanistic psychology is one of those competing perspectives. In fact, most intro books you'll find a section on it in the, one of the first chapters that introduces psychology and depending upon the intro book they'll number, I think the most common number for the number of schools of uh, psychological thought is six usually so you'll see things like behavioral psychology, biological psychology, psychoanalytic psychology, social psychology, and maybe humanistic psychology. Okay, so it's one of those. So it's that's the first thing. Second thing, it's non-reductive, non-deterministic, and not atomistic. Now what we're going to do is go through each one of those phrases and hopefully within a few minutes you're going to start to get the sensation that, hey, each one of these phrases is kind of saying the same thing, just from a slightly different perspective. Oh, it just suddenly occurred to me that I forgot a little something at the beginning of this video. Because we're doing this in the middle of the coronavirus era, uh, and as a consequence, it's sort of hard to um, get haircuts, probably. I'll be putting on hats throughout these videos, so here's your hat of the day to keep the wild professorial hair under control, hopefully. I can get it so you can still see my face. <laughs> An ill-favored thing, sir, but my known. Okay, so 
Uh, all right, so we characterized uh, humanistic psychology as non-atomistic. In other words, one way you might think of doing psychology might go something like this. Well, let's see, we want to understand what the human psyche is all about, you know. Uh, there are other disciplines that try to understand various facets of the world. One of them might be chemistry, okay? The thing about chemistry, part of what made chemistry such a success is that it has a way of sort of dividing up the different elements that ultimately combine together in various ways to produce different molecules that have different chemical properties. Maybe we could do psychology the same way, to devise, as it were, a periodic table of the basic elements of the human psyche and then provide an account of how they combine in various ways and interact in various ways to produce all of the complexity of the psychological world as we encounter it. So you if you were taking that approach, you would be taking, in a way, an atomistic approach, kind of like finding a periodic table of the atoms, much like you learn about in chemistry class if you take chemistry. So here's how I said it in your notes. Atomism is where human psychology is understood as the product of some most elemental set of forces or substances. Humanistic psychology is not going to be doing that. Okay, it's going to be taking a different approach. So it's not going to be looking for, as it were, a periodic table of the human psyche. It's not going to be doing a determinism either. Okay, so what's a determinism? Well, it's a way of seeing, in this case, the human psyche as being ultimately determined, hence the name, by some elemental set of forces or um, uh, factors or something like that. Okay, and hopefully you're, you're sort of hearing this as like, uh, that sounds a little bit like atomism, the way we described it. My goodness, I'm so glad you were able to infer that so easily, so early in the class. Yes, so atomism, in a way, would be an example of doing a kind of determinism, because when you're proceeding in an atomistic way, you kind of have the idea that this periodic table of the psych psychological elements is going to be determining all of the, co the complexities of the psychological world. Okay, so determinism. It's not, humanistic psychology is not going to be doing that either. And finally, the last term was reductionism. Okay, so what's reductionism is about? Well, kind of has the word reduce already built into the word. A lot of these words, by the way, these vocabulary words are, if you just sort of break the word apart, you can kind of already understand what it's going to entail, so that might be a helpful hint when it comes to be test time. So reductionism kind of has the word reduction or reduce embedded within it. So reductionism with respect to the psychological project would be trying to understand the human psyche by reducing it in a way making it smaller or simpler to something else. All right, so Oh, that sounds a little bit like atomism, because if you're looking for a periodic table of the human psyche, in a way you'd be reducing the complexity of the human psyche to something that would be more easily comprehensible. Yeah, you figured that out. Isn't that wonderful, too? So hopefully, definitely at this point, you're probably getting the idea that, hey, these three terms are kind of saying the same thing. Once again, humanistic psychology is not going to be doing a reductionism either. Okay, so that brings us back to our initial characterization. So it's going to be non-reductive. It's not going to be hopefully falling into some kind of uh, reductionism, a way of making the human psyche smaller or simpler than it actually is. It's not going to be a kind of determinism. That is, it's not going to be um, assuming that the human psyche is determined by something else, and it's not going to be doing a kind of atomism or looking for, as it were, a periodic table of the elements of the human psyche. Okay, so this is a way of characterizing humanistic psychology in terms of what it is not doing. So um, how does humanistic psychology, let's uh, take a little uh, sort of sidebar thing, um, how is it different from other schools of psychology? Well, uh, some other schools of psychology pretty much are proceeding in a more or less atomistic, deterministic, reductionistic kind of way. And, but let's focus on reductionism because maybe that's where you can see it more clearly. Okay, so reductionism, once again, is uh, the attempt to reduce, as it were, the complexity of the human psyche to something uh, simpler, 
and easier to understand. For instance, uh, I gave you a couple examples in your notes. Biological psychology very often wants to reduce everything psychological to the function of our bodies and more specifically uh, the function of our central nervous system is what it usually boils down to although the endocrine system plays a part there too. So if you're really sort of a hardcore biological determinist within psychology what you'll be trying to do is uh, argue that you know everything is ultimately reducible to your biology to your brain working in a certain way is kind of what it boils down to all right so then you study the brain very avidly and you try to figure out all the complexities and subtleties of neurotransmission for instance and uh, you know you look at different anatomical structures at sort of the more macro level and try to understand how they're interacting and so on and so forth so the basic game you're playing is you're trying to simplify our psychological lives to how our brain is working, okay? So, now, uh, there's nothing inherent in biological psychology that says, well, everything that you are that's psychological is ultimately an expression of something biological. There's nothing inherent in doing biological psychology that necessitates that further claim that everything psychological is ultimately something biological. It's just that it often tends to happen in a school of psychology like biological psychology. Like, you can observe this in everyday type, type artifacts because very often if you read an article about uh, psychology, let's say in Newsweek or, <laughs> God, these are old school examples. Like, no one, does anyone read magazines anymore? You know, so if you download what used to be a magazine into your cyber chip brain implant, you could possibly read about uh, some Every now and then they'd have an article about some psychological phenomenon. Let's say depression, like, oh, psychology's made some great strides in understanding depression better. And very often, I would say about 90% of the time in these kinds of popular articles, they'll say something like that to get your attention. Then almost immediately they'll go into a biological determinism about how very excuse me, various patterns of neurotransmission produce your depressive, melancholic, sad symptoms, and maybe uh, we found even some new ways of sort of altering your neural biochemistry so that those symptoms are less problematic by way of drug treatments. <laughs> trying to, uh, sometimes I say things in a somewhat oblique, not terribly direct way. I'm talking about drug treatments, okay? So uh, there's this tendency, and the, way, the reason I'm mentioning uh, these magazines is to sort of get the point across to you. There's a tendency that occurs within psychology, but it also incur, uh, occurs within the sort of a larger cultural way we tend to view psychology. All right, same is true of behaviorism. And here maybe you have to uh, think more about sort of old school behavior as behaviorism rather than cognitive behaviorism, which is sort of the main thing that's on the scene today. So the old school behaviorism, this is clearly an attempt to reduce the complexity of our psychological lives to something like the contingencies of reinforcement is how old school behaviorists uh, describe that process. So like everything psychologically, everything psychological is ultimately the product of how you've been rewarded and punished in various ways and then you can add to it various modes of associative learning or classical conditioning like hopefully you learned a little bit about that in your intro psych class and you can even add to that something like vicarious conditioning which is learning by observing others and imitating them. Okay so what's the main point? The main point is to illustrate how Within a fair fraction of mainstream psychology, there's this sort of reductionistic, deterministic, and atomistic type tendency that humanistic psychology is going to be resisting. So part of what makes humanistic psychology somewhat different from a lot of mainstream psychology is that it's going to be actively resisting that temptation. Okay. All right. So I think that maybe you're getting that. So maybe the question is, at this point, why is that tendency so prevalent within mainstream psychology? Okay, well, why does that appear so often, like this sort of desire to reduce what we are to something simpler? Well, part of the reason, there's probably any number of uh, you know, possible interrelated answers to that question, but one of them has to do with a kind of uh, ethic, I think is the right word, woven into a lot of Western scientific type inquiry and psychology in the United States, maybe you should know this, it, for a long time has modeled itself as a science. Okay, so 
when you think of science, probably psychology is not the first thing you think of. Probably the first thing you think of is maybe chemistry, which I mentioned earlier, or physics perhaps, or biology, or something like that. Well, uh, for a long time, American psychology has tried to emulate the natural, so-called natural sciences like chemistry and physics and biology. And there's an ethic that runs through those kinds of natural sciences that goes something like this. It says, you know, if all other factors are equal and you have competing explanations for some phenomenon you're interested in, and once again, all other factors are equal, like the competing explanations seem to account for what you're questioning equally well, then prefer the simpler one. Okay, so it's this, this uh, an ethic that kind of embodies a desire for simplicity, all other factors being equal. Of course, you know, if all the other factors are not equal, if one of the explanations provides a more convincing or coherent account of some phenomenon, then obviously you're going to prefer that one. But if there are competing explanations that more or less, uh, you know, perform that function equally well, then prefer the simpler one. Okay, so this ethics goes by a particular name, and you can um, sometimes hear this name in uh, regular popular culture, like I've seen it on The Simpsons and uh, I think Futurama and, you know, sort of TV shows, and it goes by the name of Occam's Razor. Okay, so Occam's Razor. Now, in your notes, I gave you two uh, spellings for that, and you may wonder why there are two spellings. Well, uh, Occam, William of Occam, lived in, uh, let's see, 14th century when spellings weren't regularized by that point and dictionaries weren't yet formed and so on and so forth. So my computer is trying to irritate me by giving me pop-ups. Make that go away. Okay, so Occam's razor. Well, I'll give you um, uh, William of Occam's initial formula for it. And um, it goes like this. My good sir, he was English. My good sir, do not, prithee, do not multiply entities beyond necessity. <laughs> okay. okay, maybe I should warn you since we're early in the semester. I sometimes like to have a good time. I know. It seems crazy, right? You know, so. Um, all right, so do not multiply entities beyond necessity. Well, thank you for that stunning bolt of lucidity there, Dr. Insight. Actually, he was a monk, <laughs> technically, but um, from the medieval period. So what does this mean? Well, it means basically what I told you it means. Like, prefer the simpler explanation if all other factors are equal. So it's this kind of will to simplicity, but the pro and that's great. That's great. That's a wonderful principle. If you're doing something like chemistry or physics or astronomy, you know. So if you have a heliocentric account of how the planets move, and you have a geocentric account of how the planets move. Heliocentric means sun-centered. Geocentric means earth-centered. And uh, you know, the geocentric one requires all kinds of like weird kind of counterintuitive mathematical twists and turns and weird tables of uh, you know planetary alignments and so on. And the heliocentric one is relatively straightforward, and they both account for how the planets move with equal accuracy. Prefer the simpler one. Prefer the heliocentric one. Okay, so that's actually an instance in the history of science where this Occam's razor ethic came into play in a pretty big way. But the problem in psychology is that human existence is inherently complex. It's not a simple thing. It's not as simple as the kind of stuff that happens in test tubes and physics labs and so on and cyclotrons and, you know, um, where they study, you know, the behavior of uh, subatomic particles and that kind of stuff. So the human psyche is a lot more complicated than sort of simple, the simple ways, relatively simple ways that matter moves. Okay, so what makes the human psyche so complex? Well, uh, for one thing, we're very inconsistent, <laughs> contradictory, paradoxical, and illogical creatures. We're not straightforward at all. You know, we say one thing, we do another a lot of the time. We claim to be X, and a lot of the time we act Y. So we're not, we're not very consistent. We lie to each other all the time. We lie to ourselves all the time. See, it's very infrequent that you're doing some kind of titration in your chemistry class, and all of a sudden the materials in the test tube rear back and try to deceive you. 
See, nature can be tricky, but it's not going out of its way to deceive you. But human beings will. Okay, so this is part of what makes uh, studying the human psyche uh, a much more complex than, uh, you know, things like chemistry and physics. And chemistry and physics, by the way, may strike you as being complicated and tricky and all that, not compared to the human psyche. Okay, they may be difficult to understand, but not like the human psyche. Okay, so we're full of all kinds of contradictions. We defy general absolutes, and maybe this impressed you when you were taking intro to psych, that it's really hard in psychology to come up with a principle that just sort of lock dead applies to everyone at all times in all cultural and historical contexts. There are hardly any rules where that's true. Maybe a handful. There's maybe a handful of sort of general psychological principles that apply to almost everyone across the globe, irrespective of culture, situation, historical context, blah, blah. The truths of psychology are not like, uh, you know, the ideal gas law in chemistry, which is PV equals NRT if you studied chemistry, okay? So it's how gases behave in terms of, you know, pressure and temperature and uh, that kind of thing. So um, we're not like that, <laughs> right? And, uh, you know, like I was saying, maybe you were impressed by this uh, in your intro psych class because almost, it almost doesn't matter what you say about the human psyche, there's going to be someone that contradicts it. So the truths of psychology are almost always general truths rather than sort of absolute type truths like F equals MA, which by the way isn't absolute either because if you move close to the speed of light that equation starts to break down anyhow. So um, it seems to be an absolute though. <laughs> so we defy absolute principles. There's almost always an exception. You may have to go a, a long way to find the exception to uh, you know your general wonderful general um, you know psychological truth like maybe you ha will go all the way to where will you go to you'll go to um, oh Phnom Penh Cambodia how about that so in Southeast Asia capital of Cambodia by the way um, uh, you may have to go all the way there to find your exception but come on seven billion almost eight billion people on the planet that's a lot of people Okay, so you can find exceptions is the point. Oh, here's another thing. Human existence, the human psyche, is largely irrational and illogical and inconsistent. Okay, irrational, illogical. We're illogical a lot of the time. Okay, so once again, the truths of the natural world are uh, comprehensible from the point of view of rationality and logic and mathematical type inquiry and so on in a way that the human psyche a lot of the time is not because we're not consistent man we won't do we won't necessarily do or say or believe or value one thing today and then the next thing you can rely on that that a week later it'll be the same thing because we change so damn often we're so inconsistent in fact when you think about it we're not even consistently inconsistent, okay? Because if we were consistently inconsistent, that would make the task of psychology easier. All you'd have to do is provide a kind of account of sort of the uniform inconsistency of the human race. But the thing is, we're not even that consistent to provide an account of our fundamental inconsistency. All right, so uh, we're worse than that, or better, depending upon your perspective. So, you know, we're not even uh, consistently inconsistent. In other words, sometimes we will be reliable over time. Sometimes, but not all the time. But that doesn't make the task of psychology any easier. You getting it? Right? Because sometimes we do make sense, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we are logical, and sometimes we're not. And so, because of that, the task of psychology is way harder than the task of the natural sciences. Okay, so <laughs> we're a little bit different from chemistry and physics and stuff like that. So um, the, the, the upshot of that is from a humanistic psychological point of view, if we really want to understand human existence and do it accurately and convincingly and so on, we need to embrace the fundamental complexity of human reality, not try to resist it by way of some kind of Occam's razor desire for the simplest possible explanation, but instead like sort of open our arms wide enough so that we can embrace the fundamental illogical inconsistent nature 
that we're living out as well as our tendency to sometimes be logical and consistent. So kind of the, the initial, one of the initial nuclear insights is that, man, we, we need to open our arms way wider than we typically have. If we really want to understand human reality, the human psyche, we need to open our arms way wider than we're used to. Okay, and by used to, what I mean is used to by way of the natural sciences. Okay, like chemistry and physics and biology and stuff like that, astronomy, etc. So part of the problem with uh, being too avidly into the Occam's razor ethic of simplicity within psychology, part of the problem with doing that is it tends to sort of cut out or diminish parts of our lives that a lot of people think are really important. Like one of them is your fundamental human freedom. Okay. So if you're looking at things from a purely sort of deterministic type way where you're everything you are that's psychological is somehow determined by something else, well, all of a sudden your freedom goes away. Well, why is that? Because anything that would count as evidence toward your freedom is itself being determined by other things. You know, in a way you never are free enough to decide what you're going to think or what you're going to feel because it's just your brain working in a certain way. You know, in a way you're just a puppet. You're sort of like a puppet dancing on the strings, right? You know, so uh, for some people that's a problem. Okay, for other people it's not. And by the way, when your freedom goes away, so too does your responsibility, right? Because you can't really be responsible if you're not free. <laughs> All right. So you're, once again, you know, you're, a puppet dancing on the strings is not responsible for the what the puppet does. <laughs> All right. So if you see your life that way, well, there you go. Now, um, okay. I guess uh, uh, now here's the phrase that I was using, but let's introduce it more formally. So natural science psychology are going to be those schools of psychological thought that, for the most part, are modeled on the natural sciences like chemistry and hence have a big Occam's razor type theme running through them. They're going to be uh, very much interested in the simplest possible explanation. So um, the most obvious examples of that would be the two that I've already mentioned. So biological psychology and behavioral psychology probably are uh, you know, the biggest examples of uh, natural science mode of psychology, but I guess to a lesser extent something like uh, cognitive psychology would sort of fall into that. Other schools of psychology are not quite so susceptible to that, like psychoanalytic psychology definitely is not a natural science mode of psychology and humanistic psychology is definitely not a natural science mode of psychology. Social psychology is sort of like it, it sort of spans the gap between the two. You know, sometimes it can be very natural science oriented and sometimes not. All right, so let's see, uh, how are we doing time-wise? Okay, one more idea. Because in the beginning I said first what we're going to do is characterize humanistic psychology negatively. That's what we've been doing so far. But let's uh, take a few minutes to, at the end of the video, to characterize it in more positive terms. Because I don't want to sort of tease you by saying we're going to do that and then not do it till the next video. So instead of taking this natural science, Occam's razor, atomistic, deterministic, reductionistic type approach, what humanistic psychology is going to be doing, dramatic moment of silence, is proceeding holistically. Okay, holistically, and that, that word is in big block letters in your uh, notes. Two different spellings, 90 plus percent of the time it's spelled H-O-L, blah, blah, blah. Every now and then you'll see W-H-O-L, Okay, so like I was saying before the camera shut off, um, humanistic psychology is going to be proceeding holistically, and there are going to be two basic aspects to this. First of all, to proceed in a holistic way with respect to psychology means that we're going to be uh, trying to understand human beings in terms of everything a human being is without reducing us to something else, some set of deterministic forces or elemental uh, you know, atoms or something like that. Okay, so it's going to be a way of trying to understand all of what we are. Okay, so our minds are not going to be more important than anything else. Our feelings are not going to be more important than anything else. So understanding, yes, our minds, understanding, yes, our feelings, our bodies, too. Okay, so there's going to be a somatic element. So somatic means just bodily oriented from the Greek soma. Okay, so our minds, our feelings, our bodies, our souls. Oh, our souls, what an interesting word. Well, actually, 
<laughs> in terms of etymology, that is, the historical progression of languages, we get the word psychology from the classical Greek word soul. Interesting. All right. So your spirituality would be sort of involved in this at some level too. Your histories, relationships, social statuses, experiences, meanings, values, freedoms, responsibilities, and more. That's hardly a comprehensive list. The point of the list, don't go memorizing the list. Memorize the idea. The idea is that it's going to be trying to understand every dimension of what we are without trying to promote one of the, or two of those dimensions as being the ultimate most important one that are determining all the rest. Okay, so that's the first element of holism. Second element of holism has to do with context, that it's a way of trying to understand everything that we are, we've already said that, also in terms of the many contexts that we inhabit, which is more or less inevitable. Okay, so you inhabit, you live your life in many different contexts. The context of your family is one. The context of uh, students in this class or students generally at West Georgia would be another one. The context of, uh, you know, being a United States citizen in the early 21st century would be one. Um, the context of, uh, you know, being a, a resident of Georgia would be another. Like uh, the context of being a resident of the United States would be another, and so on. Like ultimately, and when you think about it, ultimately the biggest context are things like, well, you're also a participant in the human race. You're also a participant in all sentient beings, anything that perceives. The word sentient means anything that perceives, okay? So all of life, you're also participating in all of life. You're also participating in the planetary context, okay? Like the Earth doing its thing. You're also participating in uh, the larger context of the solar system, all of the planets and comets and who knows what, asteroids and the sun, of course, you know, that are part of the solar system. You're also uh, participating in the galaxy. You're also participating in the universe as a whole, okay? So many different interrelated contexts that we inhabit. So if you're taking a holistic approach, you're going to be trying to do those two things at the same time. Understanding all of what we are in terms of the many interrelated contexts that we inevitably inhabit. Or, to put it in a more compact form, understanding all of what we are in terms of all of what is. Or let's say that again. Trying to understand all of what we are as human beings without cutting pieces out or reducing them somehow in terms of all of what is. And all of what is ultimately means the universe as a whole. Okay, so, um, and uh, this is not something you would tend to hear from most uh, mainstream um, schools of psychology. Okay, so they would not uh, sort of affirm the idea that, well, you know, integral to what you are as a human being is that you are a participant in the overarching processes of universal transcendence, all right? That you're a, a denizen of the cosmos. Like they would be not inclined to say things like that. But humanistic psychology is inclined to see things that way in terms of sort of the large arches of reality and not just merely sort of, a, you know, the microcosm, the little sort of narrowed view of things. All right, so we have set out to do in this first video uh, what I said we would do, which is first to characterize our topic matter in a real general way in terms of a sequence of negations, and then started to characterize it in more positive terms. And of course, the central positive term is holism. All right, and that's where we're going to pick up with the next video in this series. So number two, uh, video number two of... Uh, you're getting started series. So welcome to the class. Welcome to the jungle. We got what you need. <laughs> oh, all right. If you're not scared off and drop the course by this point, uh, yes, welcome. Glad you're here. Take care.